Punk Revolution now. Today we are going to be reviewing The Velvet Underground's debut album, The Velvet Underground and Nico. This is one of the most important albums ever released, extremely influential in rock and just music. It's just like crazy, okay? So many genres, like really good genres and really outstanding bands were super influenced by this album, including myself, really influenced by this album musically. And it's just like, it's like, so fucking good, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to go down and say, this is Punk Revolution now, you know, the channel is called Punk Revolution now, and this is a cornerstone of punk, as well as all the other genres it's influenced. So let me try to, try to just give you my analysis of this album, um, why it plays a big role in punk and just music in general, and just, you know, just kind of sum it up for you. So let's, let me get my little analysis of this album started. Let's start by taking a look at the fucking album cover. So this album cover is a work of art by Andy Warhol. When I first released this album, you could actually take the album cover and uh, the banana peel, the yellow banana peel, was actually a sticker you'd be able to peel off the cover and under the, the yellow banana peel sticker was a, a, a pink banana, which of course a pink banana looks very phallic, looks a lot like a penis. So you have an album cover that's designed by a famous artist that's also a penis. So that kind of gives you an idea of what you're, in, you're getting into with this album. It's like, a, you know, it's artsy, fartsy, cool, captivating, but also a little bit edgy and dirty and naughty. So, and that's kind of the appeal of Velvet Underground. Another thing that really kind of stood out to me the first time I saw this album cover and just kind of, you know, like, knew of, like, learned of this album's existence, I was just like, okay, so there's the Velvet Underground and Nico, but Andy Warhol's name is on the cover? What are these names? Who the fuck is, if Nico's in the Velvet Underground, why not just say the Velvet Underground? Why, 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 why make her name separate? And why are you putting Andy Warhol's name on the cover? Why are you, you should put the Velvet Underground's name on the cover. Not Andy, no one cares about the artist. We want to know about the Velvet Underground because it's their album. Okay, whatever. Confusing. Confused me. And I think my confusion over that was actually kind of justified. And I actually think that confusion I had back when I was like 13, the first time I saw this cover, whatever, was a good representation of sort of the, the tension and conflict between Nico and the Velvet Underground and Andy Warhol and their different creative ideas that went into making this album because all, you know, all three of them had different ideas. And the Velvet Underground had Lou Reed and John Cale and John Cale wanted to do acid and make drone music all day and Lou Reed wanted to play rock and roll and Nico wanted to sing like Bob Dylan and freaking Andy Warhol wanted to fucking just be like an artsy fartsy idiot who probably also wanted to make a buck off the Velvet Underground. You know, he's the, Andy Warhol was the, was the Velvet Underground's manager. M band managers usually just want to make some money off their band. Andy Warhol said, you know what? I'm gonna take Nico, this woman with a strange voice from Europe, and I'm gonna make her sing on your album, The Velvet Underground. And The Velvet Underground are saying, what the fuck are you doing? I don't wanna do that. I don't know who the fuck this person is. This is my music. I'm Lou Reed. I wanna sing on this shit. Weird stuff, right? Why the fuck are they making Nico sing on it? So you got just all these, these ideas. You know, Andy Warhol, I mean, you know, Andy Warhol, I think, understood the vision of The Velvet Underground, which is just to be naughty, use bad words, sing about sex and drugs. But you could, you could just tell there's tension going on in this album with different creative ideas. And musically, it shows because this album is a, 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 a melting pot of different ideas and creative sound. It's just like, it's, I'll, I'll put it this way. When I listen to this album, I hear two sonic experiences at once. I hear one sonic experience, which is really noisy. The guitar work is just so aggressive. Lots of feedback. It's like supposed to hurt your ears, you know? And the, the viola, which is just, you know, John Cale, the freaking, you know, psychedelic drone weirdo. I don't know what the fuck was... What the, what the fuck that was up with? Like, what are you doing? In the, I guess there was nothing to do in the 60s, so all, you, all day you just do acid and just play one note the entire day and call it drone. Whatever. Anyways, so you got... So, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, so you got one sonic experience that's droney and noisy and aggressive and hurts your ears, but you also have another sonic experience at the same time, which is really beautiful. There's a lot of beauty in this album, okay? The feedback, it just it's just the way it comes together is just gorgeous, Okay. Kind of reminds me of Shoegaze a bit, you know, like My Bloody Valentine. They're playing you know, massive, loud textures and sounds, massive guitar. But somehow Loveless, you know, My Bloody Valentine comes together in a very beautiful album. Velvet Underground did that first, okay? They're using aggressive instrumentation, like loud, noisy feedbacks of guitars and viola and the drums pounding, coming together in a very beautiful album. Noisy, but also dreamy at the same time. 
I don't know how they did it, but of course this combination works like bread and butter. It's fucking delicious. It is outstanding. A great combination, massively influential. It's kind of like they took genres that didn't exist yet of dream pop and noise rock and industrial and post-punk. Genres that didn't exist yet in 1967 and somehow made one album that's cohesively all these sounds. Really a mind fuck. If someone tried to do something like that today, it would be very difficult, even knowing these genres existed. But somehow they did it in 1967. I don't fucking know. I don't know what they did. But it, it just sounds great. And in the midst of these kind of sounds, you know, the feedbacking viola and guitar, gorgeous, fascinating to listen to, really captivating. You got moments that are just so gorgeous. Sunday morning, da -na -na -na. just pretty, just really just beautiful, kind of poppy, kind of pop. It's kind of like pop. But then you have moments like heroin. Heroin. Okay, not only is this song about heroin, you know, the song has plenty of drugs and sex lyrically all about that. I mean, that's what, that's the appeal of it. That's the punk of it, it's the sex and drugs. But if you listen to the lyrics of heroin, this is where they really strike another genius moment. The lyrics of heroin are basically saying, we live in a fucking society full of idiots who suck ass. They're all going to war and killing each other and voting for dumbass politicians. Everything sucks, everything sucks. And I just wanna do heroin to escape it all. It's very nihilistic, it's very angsty, very rebellious, very punk, okay? So not only is this album innovating this kind of, kind of this noise rock sound, while also innovating this dream pop sound at the same time, while innovating this kind of like, this whole new thing of bringing these sounds together, the attitude here is very punk, musically. This, I mean, this album is just breaking grounds, groundbreaking in every single fucking way. Really cool. And that's why I would say this album is really the cornerstone of punk, okay? You know, the Sonics were a band that were already making music that sounded a lot like punk in, the, in like 1965 and in, in the early 60s. So the Sonics were making music that sounded more punk than the Velvet Underground and Nico. But we would still classify the Velvet Underground and Nico as the cornerstone, as, as one of the, as the grandfather of punk, I guess you could say, the great grandfather of punk, I don't fucking know, over the Sonics, just because this album, in terms of the attitude, just nailed something here. It just nailed the punk attitude. And I think that has a big, a, a big part of that is kind of the, the, the scene which the Velvet Underground were coming out of, like the late 60s and, and early 70s in New York City. There's, that's really kind of like the, 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 the ground which punk rose from, okay? You got, because you got, you know, you got like a bunch of junkies who are just up to no good, really poor, just, you know, fucking and smoking and doping up and all that shit. But they're also really kind of like smart, intellectual artists, photographers, poets. Um, and they're also pretty accepting to usually in general compared to the rest of the world. You know, you'd in New York City in the 60s, you'd if you were trans or gay or whatever, you would probably be able to find a a a a community for you in New York City much better than if you were in the fucking middle of like, I don't know, Ohio or something. So New York at this time period, pretty punk, you know. Edgy, but also smart and accepting at the same time. That's the scene which the Velvet Underground arose, which punk as a whole arose. But the Velvet Underground and Nico is really kind of like the first album, the first, like the the baby, the first baby to ar arise from the scene. And then later you'd get the, you know, the New York Dolls and the Ramones and the television and Patti Smith, all that shit, all influenced by the Velvet Underground. So, attitude punk, the scene which it came from and played a big part in influencing was really the birthplace of punk. That's why it's the cornerstone of punk. Even though the Velo even though the Sonics were doing it first, even though the Doors uh, first album sound sounded more punk and came out first, even though Monk's album came out earlier and sounded more punk, Velvet Underground and Nico is really the birth of punk, in my opinion, because of that attitude. And because it set the seeds, the planted the seeds for the punk, the the original NYC, late 60s, early 70s punk scene. Velvet Underground and Nico! Musically not that punk, but attitude and everything else is very punk. And you know what, folks? Thank you for watching. I just want to say, though, everyone watching here, like, this channel, Punk Revolution Now, is the revival of, like, the true punk. Because I'd say everyone in this channel who's subscribing to me, thank you for everyone who's likes and subscribes and comments. All my subscribers are, like, they're edgy, you know, outsiders. But they're also artists and poets and photographers, creative people who do drugs and are smart. 
I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying we're the, you, thank you for watching everyone who's a subscriber is a real punk and fuck everybody else and thank you for watching and now you know it's a 10 out of 10 of course. It's one of the most influential, influential albums of all time. So thank you for watching Punk Revolution now.